Okay, so at this point you should have already watched the lectures on point, line, and shape, and today uh, we're going to talk about texture. The surface quality of a 2D shape or a 3D volume is called texture. As in the previous lectures, you can see on the slide that you have a lot of related vocabulary words which are in bold and then have the definitions next to them. Like in the previous lectures, I'm not going to read the slide to you, you're all in college, you can read, but uh, it is a good idea to pay attention to these words as they are the words that will pop up on your vocabulary quiz. So here are related terms for texture. Okay. Um, so when we talk about texture, we have two main kinds. We have physical texture and we have visual texture. Physical texture creates variations in the actual surface, right? So like when you run your hand over a piece of marble, it is very smooth. If you run your hand over sandpaper, it is very rough. If you um, feel a piece of canvas, it is, uh, has a woven texture. That is physical texture, okay? Visual texture is an illusion we create by using multiple marks. Makes sense, right? Visual mark making, we create illusions, illusion of texture. So that is how on a smooth piece of drawing paper, for example, we represent something like a woven canvas texture, a smooth marble surface, a rough tree branch bark kind of situation. Okay. So here's a slide that has some examples of how we use mark making of different kinds to represent different kinds of visual texture. Okay, so I have a couple more examples of this and this is pertinent to you, one of your visual vocabulary studies. So here's an example of creating um, textural demonstrations on cubes. And here is an example of creating textural uh, demonstrations of visual texture on spheres. You will need to pick one of these, cubes or spheres, and create six textural demonstrations for one of your visual vocabulary studies. So these are just some examples that you can check out. Okay, let's look at some historical examples. So this is an, a print of an engraving by Albert Durer. Um, if you know one famous engraver printmaker from uh, Northern Europe, you probably know Albert Rohr. He's pretty famous. If you've had art history, you definitely should have talked about him. Um, okay, so this is his work, which is called The Night, Death, and the Devil. Very dramatic title. Um, and in this, the reason I like this as an example is because he employs both visual and physical texture. Okay, so let's take a look at this a little closer. You can see the smoothness of the knight's armor. You can see the horse hide, how it's, it's fairly smooth, but you still have that light furry texture. You contrast the horse's fur with the dog, which has a very furry coat. You can see a lot of different examples of uh, texture that he is creating here that's visual texture. And he's using some things we're familiar with at this time, right? Like cross contours, cross hatching, stippling, all things we've talked about in the line and the point lectures up to this point. Okay, so we know how all this works. Let's talk about um, what's going on with the physical texture. So as I said, this is an engraving. The way an engraving is created is you take, uh, in Durer's case, you take a piece of copper, a copper plate, and you take a tool and very carefully carve into the metal plate, into the copper plate, and so you're, you're creating this drawing um, by carving it and sizing it into the metal. Then you put ink on it and you wipe the ink off the surface so that it's only in the lines that you've carved in. Then you take your paper that you want to print it on, put that on top of the plate, and you put that whole thing through what's called a printing press, which smushes them together so that the ink deposits on the paper, but also uh, the paper is embossed lightly. It has this, and embossed means like it has a, it, it has little ridges where the lines were because the paper pressed into the ridges. So if you were to run your hand across this, first of all, they would kick you out of the Louvre, which is where this is. But uh, second, you would feel the texture of all the lines. So that's the physical texture. So here we have an interesting combination of visual and physical texture. Okay, let's talk about another thing. So we have two kinds of texture. We have our visual texture and our, our physical texture. 
Um, there's another thing we use in art called invented texture. Technically, all visual texture is invented texture. I know maybe some of you are thinking that. But specifically, this term um, basically means that the artist or the designer can kind of activate a design, activate a surface, um, by creating interesting texture that doesn't have any representational relationship to what they're depicting. So here's a piece by Bruce Connor, um, kind of an interesting piece for him. He's usually more of an installation and video artist, but he's doing a portrait, right? We can see that this is a portrait, but to create interest and create this kind of fantastical look, he has used collage. And specifically, he's cutting out and collaging all these floral patterns and illustrations of gemstones over this, this figure's face, okay? So not only is this creating an illusion of texture, it's an illusion of texture that is not representationally related to the reality of a human portrait, right? So that's called invented texture. Um, he's also using other kinds of visual texture in here because we can see he's using ideas about like cross contour. He has a little bit of a circulism, which we've talked about. He has a little bit of stippling. He has a little bit of hatching, but he's using that in combination with collaged invented texture. Okay, uh, this is a illustration by Brad Holland. So he, unlike uh, this one, which is a collage, here we have... Um, hand he, all the texture is hand drawn right he he drew all of this in pen and ink and you can see that while we get the idea of representation we have a face it's also kind of a fantastical face we have the little pen nibs as the teeth on this sort of um wolfman like creature human that we're looking at but you can also see that the tighter together the marks that he's making in ink are the darker it is so we can see the relationship between textural mark making and value Value is what we're going to talk about next. So kind of put a pin in that and keep that in your head. Um, also, when creating any type of texture, there are two major factors that you need to take into account and have in your mind. The first being every material has its own inherent textural quality. Uh, not only like the, the um, woven texture of a canvas and the smoothness of paper, but for example, Charcoal. If you're working with charcoal, especially if it's a soft charcoal, you tend to have a very soft, rich kind of texture. If you're working in um, lino cuts or, uh, or engraving, which we just looked at, you're going to have very crisp and distinct lines, not the kind of soft lines of charcoal, right? So that's what I mean by the material bringing its own physical texture to your mark making. Uh, the second thing to think about is that the support surface that you're working on also contributes its own texture. So that's where we have the woven canvas. If you're working on a piece of board that has wood grain, if you're working on very smooth paper, all of that contributes its own texture. So you have to think about the physical inherent uh, textural quality of the material that you're making your marks with and your substrate. Okay, let's talk about texture and space. So um, there are a few factors that impact texture and its relation to space that I want to talk about. Um, mostly it's variations in size, density, and orientation. And the marks we make can create different spatial and, and textural effects by how we alter the size of the marks, the density, how close together or far apart they are, and the orientation, which direction they're going. Okay, so we can see here uh, that larger and darker marks, they tend to advance outward, okay? Uh, finer marks, more tightly packed, more dense, tend to pull inward. And this is just visually what it does with our mind and our eyes. Um, if you look at these marks, they've been organized into kind of a loose spiral. So we're, we're working, we're manipulating direction to add impact to a textural surface drawing. And here we have um, a look at when you combine these factors, you can create a stronger overall impact. So when you combine alterations in size, density, and orientation, you can get something that has a very strong visual impact and kind of direct the viewer the way that you want them to experience the piece. Okay, this is a piece by uh, Douglas Smith. Um, so here 
He's combining texture with another factor we're going to talk about in more detail um, in a couple of units, but I want to bring up the relationship between texture and perspective. So in this um, work, this watercolor work, we can see that he is combining texture and linear perspective to produce a really dramatic illusion of space, right? So if we look at this, we see that the lines of mortar between the bricks all point toward the truck. We're all pointing down toward the truck. And we also have the bricks themselves diminishing in size as we get down closer to the truck, which is the focal point. So it creates this kind of claustrophobic, very dynamic kind of work. And the reason that works so well is that it isn't just a simple line drawing, um, highlighting perspective and a vantage point from above. It's utilizing the uh, textural, the visual textural quality of the bricks to really drive your eye downward towards the focus. Um, in contrast, let's look at this work. So this, um, the, the work by Douglas Smith has a lot of depth, right? We have, we have the feeling of a lot of depth, like we're up really high and looking really far down into this brick alley that has a truck in it, right? Uh, so to contrast that, this is a piece by Robert Indiana. Robert Indiana is most famous for the sculpture that's the word love with L-O up here and B-E down there. You've maybe seen that. They have a copy of it at Crystal Bridges, which is nearby. But this is a two-dimensional work that he did. Um, so this is called The Great American Dream, New York. And um, in this, he is specifically making it's spatially shallow. So kind of the opposite of the Douglas Smith piece. So we can have a textural relationship that increases depth and one that reduces depth and makes a piece look more shallow like here. So to make this image, he made a cardboard replica of a coin that he layered up all the little risen areas in cardboard. Then he put a piece of paper over it and then he rubbed, he did a rubbing of it with uh, the side of a crayon, maybe something you did in elementary school, like making rubbings of coins and things. So he does this and um, it creates the illusion of a coin, but it's not the reality. Um, he's using a purely textural technique. So he's not even using the actual coin. He wanted to make it larger, but he's creating this image that refers not only to the physical object of a coin, but also to something sort of nostalgic. Like you might have the sensation of doing a rubbing with crayons when you were a kid, the smell of crayons might come up. So he's creating this thing that's very shallow in depth, but it's very texturally intentional to connect to ideas in our mind. And it's purely textural. We don't have any outside line work or anything. It's just done with the, the rubbing. Okay, so both spatial and flat textures can be made using not just abstract marks, uh, like hatching or cross hatching or stippling, but you can also utilize letters, numbers, or words um, to create this kind of uh, different textures that can add to the, the depth and the, the spatial quality of your work. So here's an example um, by Glenn Ligon. He's a quite a famous um, artist, and a lot of his work looks like this. So this is a piece that was um, printed directly on a gallery wall. Sometimes he does these on canvas as well. So basically, the density of the words, as the density of the words increases, we begin to see them fuse together and it starts creating a variation in the visual texture and reducing the visual clarity. So the more densely packed the marks, which in this case are letters, are words, the more densely packed they are together, they start to lose their um, obvious meaning, which is you know, their words, words have meaning, and instead they take on a purely textural quality. So this is another thing to think about when we're using texture. You don't have to just use things like hatching, cross-hatching, that kind of thing. You can get pretty uh, creative with it. Okay, taken to an extreme, visual texture can um, resemble reality so much that it becomes a deception. So uh, this is, there's a French term called trompe l'oeil, which means um, to trick the eye. So here's an example of this. You also see those fabulous um, chalk works on the ground where you have people walking across what is really a flat pavement, but it looks like they're walking across like a crazy tiny bridge over a waterfall or something. That's another example of Trump Loy. Um, so this is a building uh, painted, a mural on a building painted by Richard Haas, and he is taking 
Um, textural elements related to architecture and making a flat brick building appear to have this neoclassical kind of um, stairwell and, and entry point in the beginning with a, a, a coffered dome at the top, which of course doesn't, it's just a flat brick building. So this is an example of how visual texture can be used to alter our perception of the surface on a large scale. Um, and it also, when we think about physical and visual texture, because this is on an actual building and has the texture of the substrate of the building, that physical texture lends to this deception that's being created by the mural that Haas is painting, right? So, okay, let's look at something else. All right, um, as I said earlier, when I was talking about charcoal as an example versus say engraving, each material has a distinctive physical texture and each uh, drawing method or mark making method creates a distinctive visual texture as well. So combining physical and visual textures can unify a composition, right? We've seen that like with this. Um, and it can also add a, a layer of conceptual energy to it. Um, so things like blended graphite, um, Conte crayon, pastel charcoal, create a smooth surface and those kind of things are often utilized for highly representational images. So if we look at this piece by Claudio Bravo, we can see that they've carefully drawn every single little fold and crinkle in the paper to make something that looks like a photograph of a three-dimensional package that's wrapped in white butcher paper and tied with string. It's not, it's a flat drawing on paper, but you can see the extreme use of visual texture that creates a uh, trompe So this can also be used on a small scale, not just on murals, because this, this looks like a package that you could grab the string, right? It's, it's very convincing. Okay, um, Dugald Sturmer uses uh, different techniques rather than this kind of very smooth hyper realistic kind of visual uh, texture we have something very different here so we have cross hatching and he's also of course one of the contributing factors is his use of non-local color that means color um, that isn't typical to what is being portrayed so bright uh, pink green and blue are not typical skin tones but using them in uh, a portrait is an example of non-local color so here he is using non-local color he's also using vibrant cross-hatching, hatching, and stippling um, to create a much more active visual texture. So he's not trying to mimic reality, he's trying to create something that is um, a more activated, uh, activated surface with more, um, more interest, sort of above and beyond what we see in reality. Uh, Anselm Kiefer is a German artist who is kind of known for, he creates these giant, huge canvases and he's known for cre uh, combining physical and visual texture in his work. This is a pretty typical example of one of his pieces. Um, so let me tell you the story of this because it's called Wayland's Song. Uh, the story is that it comes from a myth in which the king of um, the king of Sweden captures a guy who's this really excellent artist. He's this excellent metalsmith who makes the most beautiful. Um, things out of metal, right? And that guy's name is Wayland. So the king of Sweden in this myth decides that he wants Wayland to only work for him and only make work for him, and he doesn't want him to be able to leave the palace. So he cripples him, he injures him. And so he says that he has to stay and make things for him at the king's whim, on demand, whenever. So Wayland is very angry about this. He doesn't like that he no longer has his freedom. So his response, um, is quite dramatic, almost Shakespeareanly dramatic in scale. Uh, he kills the king's two sons and turns their skulls into goblets and gives those to the king. And that is his revenge. So that's what the title of this refers to, uh, just to kind of fill you in on that story. Anyway, uh, by adding straw and a lead wing, this like bird-like wing is made out of lead, to his canvas, uh, Kiefer combines the illusionistic qualities with the, the physical immediacy of sculpture. So here we have his treatment of the background has this very impasto kind of treatment. So it looks rough and very textured. And then he has straw in it to create an actual physical texture. 
and then to create even more texture, he's adding a three-dimensional element to the surface of his two-dimensional work. Okay, this is um, a self-portrait by Benjamin Mara, and here we see each of his brush strokes describes a different facet of the face. So when I talked about shape, I talked a little bit at the end about planes and how uh, in drawing and painting, we think about how the plane, the planes of the face are part of the structure and how to study that and use that to create more realistic um, shapes, right? So here, the texture of the brush strokes of what we call very impasto brush stroke, impasto meaning very thick paint application, is playing in to the planal structure of the face, okay? And so here, um, the impasto application of the paint, because it's so thick like this, creates a physical texture. If you were to touch this, it, you could feel all the ridges from the, the paintbrush. So it creates a physical texture, but it's also creating the look of the visual texture at the same time. Okay, we already looked at this, but let's look at this again in a different context. So this is the self-portrait by Chuck Close, which I talked about when we were talking about point um, in the point lecture. So let's look at this facial portrait with Mara's. So take a peek here and then look at Mara's. And what we can see is that Close reduces the face, and I talked about this last time a little bit, he reduces the face to a grid. So he works from photographs and he makes a grid of the face and then in each little box of the grid, he's placing these dots and shapes and diamonds um, to create this representation of the somewhat um, pixelated, abstracted kind of face, right? Um, so he uses a grid and uh, then he fills it with these invented, this is an example of invented texture, right? This texture doesn't relate directly to how the actual face looks in the photograph. And so with this technique, the grid provides the structure, like how the brush strokes are um, providing the structure of the planes of the face in the last painting. Here the grid provides the structure and then the um, loosely painted interior shapes within that grid create this invented texture that's very energetic and unexpected. So it kind of energizes the work. And this is, this is another example of a use of non-local color, which when we talk about color in the next unit, I'll talk about a little more. Okay, lastly, we're gonna look at this piece by Lillian Garcia Roig. And she uses the texture of oil paint in very um, particular ways in her work. So her, the three things she's looking for with her oil paint are physical texture, um, bringing a great energy to the work, and then also having this kind of connection to her through the application. So she applies her paint in different ways. She uses a brush sometimes, but often you can see in these, um, particularly these lines of the water going around the pebbles, she's taking the tube of paint and squeezing it directly onto the canvas. So we have this connection through the physical texture of her application. We can kind of connect directly to the artist who's doing this mark making. So here we have another example of how combining the application of the media that we're using to create the mark leaves not just visual texture, but also physical texture. Okay, that is your texture lecture.